Welcome to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show with your hosts, Wayne and Gabby. Good morning. Make that just Wayne today. Gabby is still under the weather. So it uh, it's just me. We'll see how today's show goes. Uh, morning shows are very difficult to do when you're by yourself. Uh, additionally, our special guest that was supposed to be on yesterday and then rescheduled to today, Matt Legere, uh, is under the weather as well. So I think for today's episode, what we're going to do is I'm going to, I decided that I'm going to go through some Edmonton, local Edmonton real estate news, and landlord news. Um, it might be great for some of you. It might uh, not apply to others, but um, it's the market that Gabby and I invest in mostly. And uh, for those of you guys that are interested in the Edmonton market, we got some uh, some good news for you in regards to uh, the real estate market right now. And then also um, got some other news articles that uh, kind of came up related to landlording and tenants, which I think would be interesting as well. Uh, the weather in Edmonton today will be a high of 21 degrees with a chance of showers. And uh, it's going to be a little smoky as it's been a little smoky. I'm assuming most of you guys that are, um, well, probably any, anywhere on the west side of Canada, you're probably feeling a lot of that smoke lately. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a very hazy and smoky uh, summer, uh, for sure. Um, it's preventing the kids from going outside, I'll tell you that. Um, okay, so again, today I think I'm just going to be filling you guys in with some news because I don't have anyone to converse with. Uh, but what I would appreciate is that if you guys are joining the live show, um, get involved in the conversation, get involved in the chat there. Uh, if any of this stuff is interesting, if you have any comments, put them in the comment section and I will read them and, uh, we'll, we'll make the best of, of today's, uh, today's episode. Um, and if you're coming in late, uh, yes, Gabby is not here today and our special guest is not here either. So it's just Wayne and, um, let's get into it. Uh, This one literally just came out last night, about 12 hours ago. Uh, an article about uh, Edmonton compared to the national average uh, of home sales. Uh, the article reads that most of the country saw home sales decline slightly last month, but Edmonton's real estate market plowed forward on a sustained upswing. New statistics re released by the Canadian Real Estate Association, or CREA for short, on Thursday show a 0.7% dip in national home sales in July compared to the previous month. But this is what, this is pretty much what I've been seeing uh, across most of the media platforms um, is that uh, the sales are not good in Canada right now and uh, people are on the sidelines. Um, but locally, I'm, I'm seeing a significant difference. Uh, in a statement, senior Korea economist Sean Cathcart pointed to markets anticipating more interest rate cuts as one of the reasons being behind uh, slower sales activity. The Bank of Canada announced two long-awaited cuts this year, bringing the key interest rate down to 4.5% in the final week of July. But the month-over-month -month impact didn't look the same in the Hamilton, Burlington area or in Edmonton, according to CREA. Both saw sales gains in July, uh, offsetting sliding activity in Calgary and the greater Toronto area. Realtors Association of Edmonton Chair Melanie Bowles said the city's market is exceeding expectations for 2024. We had a very conservative forecast coming into this year, and then all of a sudden we saw our market take off with migration with our good inventory levels. Association statistics show Edmonton's June home sales pulled back pulled back compared to the month before, uh, with the few with the first interest rate cut arriving on June 5th. Uh, but the Edmonton area is consistently beating its 2023 residential sales numbers, starting off with a year-over-year -year increase of nearly 47% in January and soaring up to a 55% increase in April. Crazy. July sales are up 27% compared to the same time last year. Tom Shearer, broker and owner of Royal LePage Neralta, or Neralta, 
uh, real estate in Edmonton, said he expects real estate activity in the city to stay busy for the rest of the year. Interesting. Just a little side note, guys. This is this is what I've been talking about recently. Is that we've been waiting anxiously to see um, what July and August bring, because typically in a, your spring market tends to peak or plateau uh, in July, and then August is a little bit slower. September picks up a little bit, and then the winter months are just not much going on. It's still it's still activity, but just not as much. Um, but if a, if a market continues to keep exceeding expectations into August and September and then through the winter, you got yourself a pretty good market for the fall. Uh, I see Chris here is, uh, I'm in the Hamilton area, he says, and the market is pretty steady here. Not what you call fire though. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for joining in Chris and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and be a part of the chat. If you guys are coming in late, uh, it is just me and uh, myself here today. No Gabby. Um, so speak up. Let us know what you think about the uh, um, about what we're talking about. Get, get into the conversation. And um, like I said, we'll make the best of today's episode. Um, continuing on, <clears throat> uh, Edmonton's composite benchmark housing price, a measure that combines single family homes, condos, and townhouses, uh, topped 400% or sorry, oh gosh, topped $400,000 in June. It hasn't been that high since the spring of 2022 market peak with a flurry of real estate activity as the bank of Canada started a long cycle of rate hikes. You guys remember that, <clears throat> but the typical cost of a home in Edmonton continues to be well below any of Canada's other big cities. Even in Calgary, the benchmark housing price is now approaching $600,000. Um, that's about 50% more. <clears throat> um, with less than a month since the latest cut to interest rates, housing market stats have yet to reflect the full impact of the lower cost of borrowing. But after seven months of brisk sales in Alberta's ca uh, capital, Bowles said the city's housing inventory is tighter than it's been for more than two years. That's pushing conditions towards a seller's market and real estate agents will be watching closely. Uh, on the supply for the rest of 2024. It depends on migration numbers, what the builders are doing, housing starts. Uh, there are so many factors that play into the inventory question, she said, but definitely we're seeing our market sustain affordability. We're seeing good listings come on the market. We're seeing good buyer activity. So we're ho really holding a very solid market here. Very interesting. Very interesting. Carlos is in the in, in the, the live show today. He says good morning to everybody. Good morning, Carlos. Yeah, it's uh, it is doing fairly well, and our projections seem to be uh, projections and predictions uh, seem to be correct so far. Um, we're just going to have to wait and see uh, if we once we get the, the July stats and, and in August stats as well to see how long this is going to last in the Edmonton market. Are we quote unquote done for the year? Have we peaked and are we just gonna go hop into our Alberta caves and hibernate for the winter and, and then wait for the next spring market and see how it goes? Or is it going to continue to, to plow through through the winter uh, months and 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 continue to keep rising and continue to, to hold this this demand time will tell uh but not not too much time honestly it's it's we're day by day week by week we're just slowly just watching to see um but don't let that deter you or, or discourage you um <laughs> the time to buy is when nobody is buying right and even though people are buying right now um I want you to close your eyes and imagine uh, five years from now in the event that it continues to keep rising and imagine what it's going to be like in five years from now, if you don't, and if it does, um, I promise you, uh, you never really know. I, I had this conversation last night in our REI masters, uh, mentorship coaching call, uh, you never really know what the bottom is. You do, like it's it's hard to say. Like right now, most people feel like, oh, we're in the top. It's the highest price it's ever been. So everybody has that. Um, is the whole ha half full or or half empty um, uh, analogy? But you really don't know if the glass is full right now, 
or if it's empty or like you don't know where you are. Like you could be in the bottom right now in a 10 year um, look, you know, today being the first day and 10 years from now being uh, the study. um, We could be in a low right now. You just don't know because it's it's too early to tell. Or we could be in a high. You never really know where you're at. Um, But you do have to keep an open mind and perspective and consider the fact that we could be low right now. Rents could continue to keep rising and so could values over the next five to 10 years. And are you going to regret not buying in the low? And the moral of the story last night and the lesson that we taught in the mentorship uh, coaching call was that The most important thing in real estate investing is always making sure that you buy for cash flow. Now, I know it's a pretty cliche um, statement and it's, it seems pretty basic. And I even, I even make a lot of our teachings um, less exciting with terms that we use when we say things like vanilla investing, we, we invest in vanilla properties. It doesn't sound exciting. Nobody wants to go out for ice cream and order vanilla. They want to get the one with the peanut butter cups and they want to get the chocolate drizzle and they want the cheesecake chunks and they want the Oreo, you know what I mean? And they want the the peanuts, you know, um, crushed and topped all over it. Nobody wants to buy vanilla. It's not exciting. It's not sexy. Um, But the truth is, if you buy vanilla properties and good cash flowing properties that cash flow today, it doesn't matter whether the market goes up or it goes down. It doesn't matter if we're in the bottom right now or we are in the top over a 20 year period. It doesn't matter. If your property performs well today and any day, it doesn't matter. And it eliminates all of the risk of real estate investing. It pretty much drops all of your risk of real estate investing down to zero or close to zero. It's the truth. If you buy good performing properties that can perform well regardless and that have a good buffer and a good cushion, to weather out any potential storm like lower rents or higher interest rates or higher mortgage payments, whichever, or even the value of your property dropping off 50%, it's okay. Your property, your little business is still operating well. So it doesn't matter. The most important thing guys to remember is buy good properties. I know it's, it's, it's a tough one for a lot of people to understand. I don't know why, but I'm going to keep shoving it down your throats and I'm going to keep cramming it in your, in your skulls. Just buy good properties, buy good cash flowing properties that work today and every day. And it doesn't matter. Now, I'm not saying that we don't want appreciation. Trust me, appreciation on your assets is is where you're going to get most of your profits over a long term. However, um, we don't want to bank on that solely. We want to make sure that we're making money on the cash flow. We got good reserve funds. We got mortgage pay down. And you'll be fine. You'll be perfectly fine. You know, it, it eliminates all that uh, fear of like, oh, is, what if the market goes up or what if it goes down? Or I don't know. You know <laughs> just, just buy good properties today. And if you use that concept, if you uh, use that that strategy right there, that basic vanilla strategy, you, it doesn't matter when you buy. You can buy anytime, right? You don't have to focus on timing the market. Just buy right now. Buy right now with the prospect or with the hope that it does go up in value in the future. And if it doesn't for the next five years, okay, cool. You still made money. Is there anything wrong with that? But I think we all know that historically, you know, prices do go up. Prices will always go up because there's always going to be a constant demand for housing. We are making more babies than we are houses. (laughs) That's the truth. We are making more children than we are houses. And we're running out of land. So as long as we keep on making babies, which we love doing, uh, then, then we're always going to have a demand for housing and the values will always continue to go up. That's the truth. I'm going to take a quick little commercial break. I want to hear what you guys think about real estate, about the Edmonton market, and if you even want baby making, whatever you want. Gabby's not here to stop me. We'll be right back. Are you just starting to build your real estate portfolio? At Kirkwood and Brennan, we are real estate investors and mortgage brokers who understand real estate investing. Not only do we help you get a mortgage, but we help you build a better real estate portfolio. Check us out at kbmortgages.ca or call 778-847-0552. Take the time now so you have more time later. Ready to open the door to financial success with smart real estate investments? At Calvin Realty, they understand the power 
of smart investments. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just getting started, their team is there to guide you every step of the way. Picture this. Great locations, cash flow, and a portfolio tailored to your financial goals. Calvin Realty specializes in identifying great opportunities, turning your investment goals into reality. Say goodbye to guessing whether your next step is the right one. Smart moves, smart investments, Calvin Realty. And we are back. I see Chris here in the comments says, uh, agreed, uh, Wayne, vanilla equals stability. I'm glad you agree. That's that's fantastic. Um, as well, Paul um, had mentioned that less than 1% vacancy in Grand Prairie, only 1.9 months of inventory as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, Alberta is doing very well, very well. Um, uh, during the break, though, I, I did look up, you know, Grand Prairie and see what's going on what's happening in uh in gp in the news and uh paul there's absolutely nothing in the news for grand prairie real estate <laughs> absolutely nothing so i recommend reaching out to your your local um media and news outlets in, in, in grand prairie and and uh and and tell them to cover the real estate market if you'd like because there's nothing going on as far as the real estate news in uh, in grand prairie uh okay let's um Let's continue on with the conversation about the Edmonton market. And um, we're going to take a slight shift here. Um, and I, these, these last two articles that I plan on reading are a little more opinion based. Um, however, again, this is always important. Not that I believe in these, um, these articles. And it, again, just take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the reason why we're reading these articles is not for the actual words. It's it's for what. It's how people will react to news like this. And federal NDP leader Jagmeet uh, Singh was in Edmonton recently, a couple weeks ago, uh, and decided to put on a very passionate uh, news conference uh, in the city's capital or the province's capital. Um, and he was talking about rental costs in Edmonton. And what he's saying is he wants the federal government to target what he calls greedy landlords, despite rent control being a provincial jurisdiction. So he goes on to say that, so this large corporate landlord, in this case, Boardwalk, so he comes out right out of the gate and attacks one of the largest REITs um, in Alberta and uh, subsequently one of the largest landlords um, or property management companies in, in Edmonton as well. Um, if you've ever been driving past an apartment building, most of them have got that boardwalk sign sitting out right out front. And um, what he's saying is that they're getting federal supports, federal money, um, they're getting the CMHC backed insurance to support lower interest loans. So they're getting this help and then they're turning around and ripping off Canadians. He says, uh, Singh calling out property rental giant boardwalk, accusing them of benefiting from federal support while raising rents on tenants, federal ND, uh, the CEO of boardwalk, uh, responded by telling city news on Friday that the federal support they get for lower interest rates goes towards affordable housing and maintaining their properties. And I got to side with Boardwalk on this one. I, I'm, I, you guys know me, I'm always neutral. But I, well, we'll read the rest of the article in a sec, but to say that they're getting all this money from you know CMHC and insurance and whatnot and these um, lower interest rates and these longer amortizations speak, the trade-off for that is that they have a certain limit to how much they can charge for rent. So Boardwalk is fulfilling their obligations as per any CMHC program that they're associated with, whether that be MLI or MLI Select. So I don't, I don't, I don't honestly know what the leader of the NDP is is going on about here. Uh, I mean. I would suggest that he do a little, I mean, he's the federal NDP leader, for goodness sake. Like you, you gotta, you gotta understand that <laughs> the, 
the CMHC program is, 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 is pretty straightforward. If you go to their website and you look at it, I mean, the, if you want those, those incentives, those, those benefits, uh, for those in, insured mortgages, um, there's requirements and unless of course he's pointing out exactly that unless of course he's pointing out exactly that what requirements that they're reneging on i i don't i don't know what his claim is here um because he's saying that i'll, I'll continue reading on like I, I i don't see any actual evidence of any wrongdoing here i think it's just like hey uh there's these programs and rents are still high in edmonton so we're going to pick on the largest uh, property management company and REIT in, in Edmonton um, because what, they're the biggest? Um, so the CEO of Boardwalk says that um, we have purchased new communities from builders, uh, five builders with capital to build more communities. We have partnered with federal partnerships and provincial partnerships to build more affordable housing with capital grants. Um, but Canada's NDP leader is still taking the company to task over rent increases. With Boardwalk, we've seen some of the highest compared to cities across the country. So not just small increases, but some of the highest in the country, said Singh. But the CEO of Boardwalk says, while Edmonton's average rental rate is going up, it is still one of the most affordable major Canadian cities to rent, uh, adding his company does subsidize and provide flexibility for tenants who can prove they need it, going on to say rent is ultimately tied to inflation. That's a stretch. Uh, since 2015, discounts have appeared and, or sorry, have disappeared and rents have increased, but they're still below the consumer price index adjusted to 2015. So overall, rents typically rise as the consumer price index, and that's exactly what data shows over a longer period of time. So we have to look at data in a wider time range, explained Colius, who's the, um, the CEO of Boardwalk. Um, very interesting. Uh, as I said, guys, um, if Boardwalk is, is utilizing the CMHC, any of the CMHC programs where they're getting, uh, benefits, which would be lower interest rates or longer amortizations, et cetera, or, or even better loan to value ratios, uh, they need, they need to meet minimum criteria. And the criteria is, um, energy efficiency accessibility and um, I can't remember the exact term, the right term for it, but it would be uh, affordability. And the affordability requirements are pretty straightforward. They have a table to which, you know, a certain amount of your units must meet uh, or must be under a certain rent. So I don't understand like why, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's some proper, research ahead of ahead of speaking probably would have you know stopped him from from saying something like this because it doesn't make any sense it's just picking on the biggest the biggest um the biggest landlord and i i just don't think that's very fair um ultimately you know the ceo of boardwalk said that it's tied to inflation which again like i said it's a bit of a stretch ultimately it's tied by them to the market the reason why boardwalk you know, raises funds through the Real Estate Investment Trust. And the reason why they buy properties is to make profit. They are a for-profit, you know, company, just as all of us are. And all of us, you know, I, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I'm telling you guys to go buy good cash flowing businesses because you guys are looking for properties that operate well and, 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 and function well as a cash flowing business. So of course, you're going to invest in the areas in the properties that have the highest rents and the lowest expenses, taking into consideration all the other fundamental uh, fundamentals of real estate investing as well. But ultimately, one of the most important things for us running our business is that we have good cash flow and good reserve funds so we can weather out these storms. So yeah, obviously, we're going to be investing in areas that have higher rents. And obviously, we're going to charge the most that we can within reason and within, you know, morals and values. So rents have definitely been going up in the Edmonton market uh, significantly. I just think that they're going up. I wish I wish they would have gone up more steadily over the last 15 years and not so dramatically overnight. Because when you when you when you 
hit hit the system and you shock the system like this with huge increases and in six month or 12 month periods, yeah, people are going to complain because they weren't ready for it. But you have to keep in mind that the, the rents have been lower than the national average for over a decade. So yeah, it's due. I look at it as we're long overdue. And I've said that many times. We're long overdue for these increases. Rents across Edmonton <clears throat> and Calgary before 2022 were were the same for like 10 years. Anybody asked me, hey, what's the market rent for this? I'd be able to tell them because it's been the same for the last five years or 10 years. So yeah, we're getting some huge increases. I, I look at it like it should have been going up one or 2% every year um, for the last 10 years uh, to keep up with inflation, to keep up with rising costs of property taxes, insurance, et cetera. But it didn't. So you know, 10 years ago, we had really good cash flow. And then every year, the cash flow diminished and diminished and diminished and diminished because the cost of expenses kept going up, like property taxes, insurance, and, and even repairs. And the cost of handyman has gone up significantly as well. And contractors it kept going up and going up, but our rent stayed the same. So our cash flow just kept diminishing and diminishing and diminishing. But now the it finally caught up. And it's like everybody's, oh my God, like rents are too high. Well, what they're starting to do is they're starting to become the average. They're starting to meet the national averages, you know, for the rest of the country. And I, I mean, I don't like it. I mean, if, 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 if I had a little old grandmother that, you know, was living off of CPP and her small little pension making $1,700 a month and trying to find a rental for $900 a month and being denied because her, her cost of rent exceeded 50% of her, her net income or her gross income every month. And then, yeah, I, I would feel pretty bad that my grandmother had to live in some, sh dare I say, shithole because that's all she could get with some crappy landlord. Yeah, I get it. Trust me. You know, it's, it's, it's easy for us as a business to, to think, you know, it is what it is. And this is a business. Um, I'm not so far detached from this that um, I'm ignorant to the, to the, to the issues with the people that are most vulnerable. Um, however, there are lots of government programs in place that are that are protecting the most vulnerable, and that's programs like the CMHC programs that are out there, um, and other incentives that each you know municipality and, and 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 province has put into place in order to make the 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 lower class or the lower middle class um, living expenses a little more affordable or rent more affordable. But to attack the largest landlord for not for for doing something that they didn't even do anything wrong, I think is unfair. I think it's very unfair. Um, I can tell you with certainty that putting my investor hat back on, I know that rents are going to continue to rise. I anticipate that across the board, I would say across all rental property types in Edmonton being your from your one bedroom apartment to your one bedroom basement suite to your main floor suite to your townhouse to your single family house to your house with the second to your to your even to your your large um um 2000 square foot houses i anticipate by this time next year that market rents will be anywhere from 15 to 20 percent higher It's very bold of me to make predictions like this, but this is just based off of the data and research that the, the research on the data that I've um, I've gone through, and it's we are still well below the national average. I I I, I would not be shocked to see a fifteen to twenty percent increase in market rent across all property types in Edmonton within the next twelve months, because there is a serious serious rental shortage. And if I were to put a rental out right now, which I, I, I put a handful of rentals out on the market this month, um, and they filled very quickly, and I got all completely overwhelmed with inquiries. If I put another one out next month, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident that it's going to be the same. And as a, as a business owner, as an investor, I'm going to push my rents up a little bit. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to see how much I can get, right? If people are willing to pay for it. That's my investor hat on. And if they're for the most, I will say for the people who are most vulnerable, 
the people who, who cannot afford it, then that's why there's programs in place, right? For the people who are in positions where it, they, they can't, can't, that four letter word with the apostrophe. If someone can't do it, then there's programs in place to help them. Can't is a funny word though. Life is full of opportunities. I made some really, I made some really big decisions in my early twenties because I didn't like the way that my life was going. I was pumping gas. I was 20 years old and I was pumping gas and I had failed my pursuit of going to school to become an accountant. And all of my friends were into their second and third years of, of, of school to be engineers, one for geology, one for mechanical, one for electrical. They were off all going and doing these great things. My other friends had, you know, gone and got jobs at the plants right out of high school with their dads. And they were already making 25, 30 bucks an hour. And here's Wayne making fucking $9 an hour which was, I think, the highest for minimum wage at that time, 37 hours, if I were lucky. I made the decision that I didn't want to do that anymore, and I had to do something different. And all of my prospects and all of my family weren't going to support me in that. I had to do something different. And so I moved halfway across, or I moved across the country in order to create more opportunities. And I begged and I pleaded for a company to take me on. And I worked my ass off and I worked my way up that company to get a trade ticket. And then I got that trade ticket and then I moved to a union company and I was making $37 an hour within a few years. I worked hard for it. And throughout that pursuit, I decided that, you know what? $37 an hour is fantastic or $38 an hour, whatever I was making. And all these overtime and double time hours are fantastic. But is this my life? Is this the best for me? If I could do what I did already, what's stopping me from continuing to move forward? So I started asking questions. I started reaching out to people about investments. What can I do differently? How can I, how can I do better for my family? How can I set myself up for retirement? I have all this money, but I'm never going to make any more money than this. So I started learning about real estate investing and I kept pushing and I kept pushing and I'm pushing. So I'm telling you a guy who's 20 years old, who's pumping gas, that's living in his grandmother's basement, paying her $400 a month. If I can do it, anybody can fucking do it. There's opportunities everywhere. It just takes one decision. So I'm saying if someone can't, can't, there are no options. There are programs in place in order to protect those people. If you can't because your, your body does not permit it because you have an injury, okay. If your body has um, mental injuries or, or, or perhaps incapabilities, then okay, that, that makes total sense. I, I, feel, I'm, I feel for people in that situation that don't have the capacity to do that, that can't. But everybody else can. So there's not a whole lot of sympathy for me here because I've been there. I've been in that spot where I had no prospect of anything in my life. I was going to be at that same gas station until I was 40 and probably single because no one woman would come even fucking close to me. So when we talk about stuff like this, we talk about affordability for rent in the most affordable city in Canada. Again, I hope this gives you a little more context into my feelings around it. Each and every one of you guys that are here joining us live this morning, each and every one of you guys that are listening to this podcast, you are, you are making a decision to better your life. You're taking that first step. And I applaud you for that. Um, you are trying to create a better life for yourself and for your family and for your future family. I admire that a lot because I've been where you are. And just keep sticking to it and, and don't, don't be a victim. Take life into your own hands. Take control of your life. Do something different. Go against the grain. Make good fucking decisions. And then you'll never be in that position where you're complaining that it's the government's fault or it's big property management company's fault. I'm going to take a quick little commercial break. And then I got one more article I want to read you guys. If you guys got any comments, put them in the, in the, in the chat there. Um, and if you guys are listening to the recording of this podcast, um, and you have any comments, you can feel free to just email us as well at info at reimorningshow.com. It's time to sell your house or buy a new one or an additional one. 
But where do you start? Do you drive around neighborhoods hoping to spot for sale signs? Do you take a shot in the dark with a real estate listing website? Or do you go with an experienced and focused realtor? Nazarene Legier is the licensed expert realtor you've been hoping you would find. Working in Calgary and surrounding areas, whether you're buying, selling, or investing, Nazarene will help you bridge the gap between you and your real estate goals. Find Nazarene Legier online at houseandhomeyyc.net. Well, 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 investors, you're looking for some lucrative off-market opportunities, but all the good deals seem to have dried up on the MLS. What do you do? You go to Legier Home Buyers, a Calgary premium wholesaling company. That's what you do. Whether you're looking for the next fix and flip, buy and hold, burr project, or redevelopment, you'll find the best off-market deals with Legier Home Buyers. And don't worry, Legier does the work for you. Join the buyers list on calgaryoffmarket.ca and edmontonoffmarket.ca today. You've got showings, lease signings, sweet renos, condo board meetings, credit checks, mortgage financing, and every so often the tenant clogs the sink because they shove macaroni down there. Stop. 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 Breathe. Breathe. Leave the bookkeeping to Fingo. Fingo is specialized real estate bookkeeping by real real estate investors with tailored services for maximum returns. Save time. Enhance your returns. Claim the plumbing repair for that ridiculous macaroni fiasco. Book your free consultation at Fingo.com. And we are back. Okay. All right. I see in the comments here, uh, Paul says another idea for another show. Uh, he says, advice you'd give to graduating students trying to find their way, possibly in the real estate investing direction. Oh, God. Oh, they're not going to want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> it's, um, that is, that is a good idea. That is a good idea. It's, I'll be honest with you. I, I, um, I like that. Uh, one of these days when I'm running, running out of things to talk about in the morning show, I'll bring it up. Um, if I, if I put that together in like a, like a 45 minute presentation to be set on stage, I'd probably butcher it. I find that, um, I find the best, the best ways to, to really share that are just in, in raw moments, like before the break and, and, and it's, it's more authentic and truthful. Um, yeah, I'll be honest with you. Uh, most people in that position aren't ready to do what needs to be done. Um, real estate investing is 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 pretty simple. Another conversation that we had last night in the, the real estate investing masters mentorship um, coaching call last night. Uh, I get this a lot where like people will like, join our program and then like three to six months in, they're like, "Yeah, like I've been showing up to the weekly coaching calls and." Um, it just seems like it's getting repetitive. Like the same questions are like the same topics are being had and the same questions are being asked. And I'm like, yeah, it's cause like the new people are asking all the questions and I'm answering them. But then again, you're not asking any questions. You know what I mean? And we're really, really, really good at simplifying real estate. Everything that you're hearing here right now, it's just amplified in a better version in the mentorship program. Um, it's more, it's, it's less like, this is kind of spotty information where like, we'll talk about one thing today. We'll talk about a different thing tomorrow, but like in the mentorship program, it's like, we're, my goal is to get three years worth of education, something that would normally take you three years into three months. And we do it very well. We get people caught up to speed very quickly. No bullshit, no fluff. Let's just get to the point. So as soon as you're done and you have a good level of understanding, then we can start focusing on the real difficult stuff, which is where people quit. And this is why people are saying things like, oh, it's getting repetitive and I don't know. It's like, I just don't feel like I'm learning anything new. No shit. There is nothing else new to learn. Now it's time to go do the work. So when it comes to real estate investing, you know, a lot of you guys already know how to do this. A lot of you guys have been listening to the show for a very long time. You've got the gist. You understand everything. And, you know, now it's time to take the action. Now it's time to go and ask your mom for money, you know, to joint venture with you. And most people don't want to do that. So, you know, the same thing goes to graduating students. Like, I promise you, your $70,000 worth of fucking student loan debt um, and your $3,000 credit card, you're in no position to be investing in real estate. And if that's the case, it means it doesn't mean that you can't. It means that you, you are no longer trading or investing your money. You are trading and investing your time. 
and your expertise. So first things first, you got to become a fucking expert in real estate investing, get that all down and figure it out. And then you need to prove it to people. That's it. That's the secret sauce. You need to become an expert and then you need to prove it to people. And it's hard to prove when you don't have anything to show for yourself because you don't have your own money to invest. So this is where people get caught up and this is where people come in. They hang out for two to three years. They figure it all out and then they realize they don't want to do it. So um, advice to graduating students. I mean, God, it's a tough one to give. It's a tough one to give. I get lots of, I, I have like in, in REI Masters, we have less than a handful, but are people that are under the age of 25. And we've had a lot of people under the age of 25 over the years. And um, some people are really great. And they, they're, they're, they're going against the grain and they're, they're ambitious. Um, but a lot of them, even though they come out of the gate very ambitious and full of piss and vinegar, um, there's not a whole lot of... Um, they don't last. And I find that, uh, that the mid-30s investors or the early 30s investors are typically the ones that last a little bit longer because they've been around their job for 10 years or 15 years. You know what I mean? They've been in the working industry. You know, they've, they've had a job. They've woken up at 530 every morning with their thermos and they've done it for 15 years and they know that they don't ever want to do that ever again. So they have something that's pushing them away. Um, whereas, you know, young students just at a, at a university or college, they don't really have that pushing them away and they don't know what the other alternative is. So they, they quit, they get into the, the, you know, the working life. And then, then 10 years later, when they realize that they've peaked, they can no longer climb the corporate ladder anymore. They've made the most that they can make at $37 an hour. And uh, that's when they start questioning their life and their decisions and where they're at. It's called a midlife crisis, right? A little bit of a different version of the midlife crisis, but everybody does come to that realization. Their child is nine or 10 now or 15, whatever. They got nothing moving. Like they have no future. There's nothing new that's going to be coming. They're just going to do that same thing for the next 30 years. That's a fucking terrifying moment to be in. It's also a really good motivator. Yeah, I see you there, Kyler. It's a, it's, it's a fantastic motivator to realize that I have peaked. This is the best that my life is ever going to be. And I'm going to do this for the next 30 years. And the only thing I have to look forward to is my next Mexico vacation in November and the me next Mexico vacation after that, the following November, if I can get enough overtime in order to save money <laughs> to pay for it, which most people don't. Isn't that fucking depressing? It's a tough one to teach a, a postgraduate. But anyways, um, last article here, uh, going back to the, the whole topic around tenants. Um, this one came up, I saw an article about this, it was a BC article and then I've seen it, uh, in Edmonton as well. And it's the time of year, or at least last month was the time of year when you start getting the heat waves and it was pretty darn freaking hot this year. And also in Edmonton with the smoke. The smoke and the heat, it just meant that, I mean, it was very difficult to spend time outdoors this summer. It was very difficult. Um, and if it wasn't 35 degrees and it wasn't so smoky that you couldn't breathe outside, it was raining. <laughs> the summer was absolute garbage. Um, but anyways, uh, with the extreme heat, um, a group of climate activists are worried uh, about renters. And this, this comes up every year, um, but I, I saw a lot more of it this year because of the heat from wave from this year. And so a group of climate activists are worried about renters who have no escape from the summer heat. Um, they said, we heard stories of people with apartments, apartments over 40 degrees having to live in darkness for weeks at a time pets throwing up from how hot it was, coming home only to have to go to a hotel, said Hannah Bain with Climate Justice Edmonton. I know people who had to go to the hospital for heat stroke just from being in their own apartment, said Juan Vargas, who was also in the group. Many Edmonton renters don't have the luxury of having air conditioning, some describing their apartments like being in a coffin or an oven. 
Climate Justice Edmonton did a survey in May of roughly 36% of Edmonton rest- renters asking about their experiences with extreme heat. I'm just going to pause it there. Um, if you're going to claim to have done a survey of, of roughly 36% of Edmonton renters, I'm going to call bullshit on that one. I don't think you should, like, they could have very well, but if you're doing a survey, you have to actually, and you're going to state that you did a survey, you actually have to have factual data. And I don't know how many renters there are in Edmonton. I'm going to do a quick Google search. That doesn't really tell me. I don't know how many renters there are in Edmonton. But to say 36%, that's, let's assume that there's 500,000 renters. They're saying that they did a survey of 180,000 people. Mm. I think that's a, that's a bit of a stretch. Um, Of that, 30% described the heat as inescapable at home, while 85% said landlords didn't respond to needs for a cooler place. Remind me, if I forget, just put in the comments, um, to tell you guys a story, because I had a tenant that that requested um, that we install air conditioning. Um, and I'll tell you a little story about that um, and, and, and our position on it. Uh, We went on to say, uh, we are going to see hotter and hotter days and renters, uh, hotter and hotter days and renters. Tenants are facing a lot of extreme situations. The group is calling on the city to create a maximum temperature bylaw. That would set a ceiling on how hot it can get in an apartment before a landlord is forced to step in and support their tenants, said Vargas. Councillor Michael Jans told CTV News Edmonton, it's an important issue councillors are discussing. We should be talking about how we protect people from heat waves, and we know summers are only going, getting hotter from here, he said. I think it's the right question, but I think it's the wrong order of governments they are asking, said Councillor Andrew Knack. Knack believes the issue falls under the Residential Tenancies Act and is the UCP government's responsibility to address. That's a very good point. Um... Uh, I'm going to actually disagree with Councillor Knack because it it would not fall under the Residential Tenancies Act. It would fall under Alberta Health Services because there is a minimum. Well, I'll, I'll read on and then I'll explain. That legislation mandates rental housing standards in the province, which includes a minimum indoor temperature of 22 degrees, but does not set a maximum temperature. That's false. The Residential Tenancies Act does not talk about a minimum indoor temperature. The Alberta, the, the, oh God, the minimum housing and health standards of Alberta covers the minimum indoor temperature. That does not fall under the Residential Tenancies Act. So that's incorrect in this article. It falls under the minimum housing and health standards. And I don't know who's responsible for the minimum housing and health standards, but it probably still follows, follows under um, the UCP government's responsibility to address it and not the city of Edmonton. The city of Edmonton can speak up and they can put something like that in place, but um, the minimum housing and health standards falls under the province of Alberta. It doesn't fall under the city of Edmonton. So again, I think they're going to need to check their their information, do a little bit of research, especially the person writing this article. Um, Alberta's government recognizes that the province often experiences very hot temperatures and encourages landlords to ensure their units are safe and comfortable for tenants. Brandon Albutef, uh, the Minister of Service Alberta, um, press secretary said in an email, we're always willing to hear feedback from Albertans on issues like this, he said. Okay, so yes, the, the minimum housing and health standards of Alberta does cover a minimum indoor temperature of 22 degrees. It does not have a maximum temperature. <sighs> I'm not not sympathetic to this. I think that I know exactly how hot it can get. 
And I personally installed air conditioners in every house that I've ever lived in because of this. I know that there is periods of time during the summer where it gets ridiculously hot. Um, and in most cases, I think with a proper fan and closing your blinds, you know, during the day and, you know, keeping all that cool air in there and, um, you know, keeping it dark, it does provide a solution during the day. You can also hang out in the basement. Um, my office is in my basement and I'm constantly freezing. Like you guys ever see me on video, a lot of times I'm wearing a sweater and sweatpants, um, in the middle of the summer, um, cause it's the coolest spot in the house. Uh, but I tell you though, on my second floor in my bedroom, it is ridiculously hot. And that's just the way that, you know, air flows. It's, it's, that's going to be the last spot that it, that it reaches, and especially when you got an air conditioner blowing, it's going to blow from the furnace, which is in one corner of the house through all the vents through the basement and through all the vents in the main floor and through all the vents in the upstairs floor as well. But typically what happens is the farthest spot in the house is typically the hottest spot because, um, it can only blow so far, right? The cool air. And also depending on how many windows you have in there and whether they're closed or they have blackout curtains as well, it's going to be the hottest spot in the house. So me personally, like my own house, my bedroom is the hottest spot in the house. So I crank the AC at like six o'clock. I'll keep it at a, at a reasonable temperature of like 22, 23 degrees during the day, especially because I'm downstairs and it's effing freezing. And then around six o'clock, I start raising it by two degrees at a time. So I can get it to a point where it's like as cold as possible in my bedroom. The rest of the house is freezing, but my, at least my bedroom is, is nice and cool. And I have that ability because I own my own home and I installed uh, an air conditioner. And it's difficult for renters, obviously, because they're not allowed to install something like that at a property. One, they're not going to want to do it at a property that they don't own because they're not going to spend 2000 to $3,000 on a unit and then leave in a year or two. And then the person, what are they going to take it afterwards? with them? <laughs> what is this, Quebec? <laughs> Where you take all your appliances in your air conditioning unit? I mean, for God's sake. Um, <laughs> no, you're not going to do that. So it's probably going to get left behind. So why would somebody want to make that large investment if, if it's just going to be left behind? Additionally, uh, most landlords don't allow tenants to install anything, right? Hey, you're not allowed to do any major alterations. So it's, it's for tenants, it's very difficult, right? And finding a rental unit that already has an existing air conditioning in it is so rare. The, the properties that I, like the tenant, the rental properties that I have that have um, air conditioning units are properties that I used to live in. <laughs> I would never install an air conditioner into a property and pay 2,500 bucks to get that installed. Um, it's just not a good investment, right? Not to say that I'm a cheap landlord, it's just the truth. Like, why would I, why would I spend that money? for something that only gets used, you know what I mean? Like in those extreme circumstances for three weeks out of the, out of the year. Um, so the ones that do our rental properties that do have air conditioners are ones that I used to live in. Those are ones that I lived in. I moved out and it became a rental property. Um, you do have to feel for tenants though, because like now they don't have an option. You know what I mean? They don't have an option to install an air conditioner. Um, I, I mentioned it, that I see Chris in the comments here. He's, um, he said, if you weren't going to call BS, I was, that was referring to something else earlier, but um, I, I told you I was going to tell a story about, uh, so a tenant did ask us this summer during the heat wave or a little bit early in the summer that they, um, oh, Chris was talking about the survey that, yeah, those numbers are definitely bullshit. Um, we had a tenant that early on in the summer said that he is, and I guess he's an HVAC technician, um, and said that he can get a really good deal on a air conditioning unit and said he's willing to pay for it if we pay for the cost to install it, which is about 50% of the cost. So, oh, sorry. No, he said he would install it for free if we bought the unit at his wholesale price. And I think it was something like 1400 bucks. And he said, so let me know. And this house is a, a two-story house and no suite or anything in it. It's just a, a two-story um, single family rental. And part of me was like, well, if I did buy it, then obviously like, you know, it would be appealing to tenants in the future, but it won't increase the value of my property at all. 
it only increases the desirability, right? And on that property, I think we've got something like maybe $15,000 in the reserve fund. So we have the funds in there. It's like 10% of our reserve fund. Just keep in mind that that reserve fund is, is set and, and spoken for, for the cost of replacing a, a furnace in the near future, replace the cost of replacing a, a, a roof and a hot water tank and any other major expenditures that come up, um, appliances, things like that. So that money's already kind of spoken for. But it's very easy to be like, oh, it's only 10% of my reserve fund. Why not? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's going to be great for our tenants. But it's not going to, I'm not going to get any return on that investment. I'm just literally just putting money into that and not getting anything back. And as an investor and as a business owner, that makes zero sense. And so I let the tenant know that unfortunately, um, it's not approved. And they did not like hearing that. <laughs> they did not like hearing that. They basically, their, their position was that you're a cheap landlord. And it's not, my position is it's not a requirement. It's not my requirement to. And if someone really wants a luxury like that, by the way, this is a luxury. This isn't a, a necessity. It's not a, it's not a right. It's a luxury that somebody wants. If they want that luxury, they can pay for the cost to install it. You know what I mean? They can pay the $1,400. If you're planning on staying there for the next five years, dividing that $1,500 cost, you know, over, over five summers is $300 a summer. If, if, if staying cool is that important to you and you don't want to use fans or open up windows, then the cost is $300 a year. And I think that's quite reasonable. Because what people are explaining is that they're, that they're, they're in a situation where it's so hot that I have to go and I have to go to a hotel. That's not fair. That should be the landlord's responsibility. It's their house. It's not my weather. It's not your weather. It's not like you, you turned up the dial on Mother Nature and cranked it up to 35 degrees and it's 44 degrees in the rental unit any more than it's, you know, your responsibility to make sure that the, the house is warm. I mean, we have a furnace in place to make sure that, yes, that the pipes don't freeze and that the people stay warm. But ultimately, air conditioners are a luxury. You can get fans, right? You can have fans on you. And that's a solution to keep it cool. But my my opinion on, on this of like having a maximum temperature, um, I don't know. It, it's only a few weeks out of the year. This isn't like a situation where it's like a whole season where we have to keep this thing cool. If we were living in the desert and it was constantly um, 45 degrees every day, and then yeah, of course, I think that some measures would need to be put in place in order to protect people from that. But there's many, you know, cities and, and countries in the, across the world that, you know, they live in extreme heat all the time. A lot of us vacation in those areas. And, you know, are there any landlord responsibilities there for making sure that it stays cool all the time? No, of course not. And yes, it is, is it's a situation where some of the most vulnerable people, you know, the, the, the elderly and, and, and some younger, um, you know, children, obviously there's, the heat can be pretty bad for them. But again, like a good fan, investing in a good fan, you're probably gonna spend $300 on fans, um, you know, in each room, we'll, we'll solve that problem. At least make it manageable enough that no one's going to die. Um, and if you're going to spend 300 bucks on fans, why not spend 300 bucks a year and get an air conditioner installed? Um, that relationship with that tenant that I was talking about has, has gone sour. Like they're, they're now they're they're The relationship's been ruined. Uh, but to have to, and to spend 2,500 bucks or $3,000 on each of our rental properties to put air conditioners in so that people can stay cool for three weeks out of the year. I think it's a bit of a stretch. I'll be interested to see how this whole survey and this whole um, movement goes and to see if they're able to change it. But um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that this, I think it's just the time of the year and that's the news that people want to read and that's what they want to complain about right now. And in a couple of weeks, you know, things will start getting cooler again. It'll be September and suddenly the overnight um, temperature will be negative five degrees and suddenly we won't be complaining about anything like this again. Uh, and then we'll just wait for July of next year when it comes up again. But uh, I'd like to know what your thoughts are if you guys are listening to the show. And, you know, send us an email. Let, let us know what you think. We can talk about it on Monday a little bit more about 
what do you think about landlords being required to have air conditioning? I think it's, I think it's a little ridiculous. I'm going to add one last thing. Actually, I forgot. I just made a note. I made a note of this. I forgot. And then we'll, we'll wrap up today's show. And thank you guys for, for joining in live. I appreciate it. And thank you for being a part of the conversation. Um, this whole article discussed apartments. I don't know if you guys noticed that. They kept talking about apartment units and 44 degrees in apartment units. Um, the interesting show, <laughs> interesting thing about uh, apartments is that you can't install air conditioners. How, what are they expect? Are they expecting each individual unit to have a a unit installed in the window? Is that what they're expecting? So in your one bedroom apartment where you've got one window in your bedroom and you have one large window in your kitchen, maybe, and then you have a large sliding door or a window in your living room, are you saying that one of your two or three windows, you want to put an air conditioning unit in it? You're not going to have any, any fresh light coming through. In apartment buildings, it's not like you can set in like central air conditioning <laughs> and have it going through all the different units. You, this, this is literally, they're talking about having window air conditioners installed in every single unit. I'll tell you this, if this gets passed, because I'm an entrepreneur, guys, I'm a business, you know, I, I, I think I think about what's coming and what opportunities are coming. Here, here's, here is a hot tip for you guys. If this argument or this movement actually starts getting some traction, I want you guys to go and start an HVAC company because this will be one of the biggest opportunities for HVAC companies in the history of, of heating and cooling and air conditioning. If every landlord is required to have an air conditioner installed in their rentals, that will be a ridiculous, Ridiculous opportunity for sales. Just imagine, just imagine the cost of air conditioning units going up and the demand for everybody getting them installed before, before July 3rd, July 25th of next year, everybody has to have an air conditioner installed in their rental properties. Absolutely. And then if they're going to get air conditioners every rental, then it's almost going to become an almost, um, it's going to become a provincial norm or a city norm that every, even every home is going to have an air conditioner as well. It'll be almost like air conditioners are of the same importance or expectation as a furnace. Because if every renter is getting it, then every homeowner is going to get it as well. So you can kind of see how it's a little ridiculous when you look at it from that perspective. Right. Additionally, I, I, other than an air conditioner being installed, I honestly don't know what solution there is to this. Like, are you going to go down there and, and it's the wording. I know I'm going a little over an hour now. Um, what was the wording on this? It's the responsibility of the landlord's responsibility. Where is it? I can't seem to find it right now, but basically that it's the, it's the landlord's responsibility if it gets above that. But like, does that mean that the landlord's going to pay for the tenants? to live in a hotel room until the suite is below 44 degrees that, or a certain threshold. It's interesting. I, I, I don't know what solutions there are other than installing um, an air conditioner in there. Unless of course they're responsible for the expenses that are incurred from a tenant who cannot escape it. It's interesting stuff. But anyways, like I said, if this ever gets any traction, I highly recommend you guys start an HVAC company as quickly as possible and start ordering air conditioning units in bulk in bulk because it's going to be a great opportunity for a business but that's it guys that's today's show thank you guys so much for joining and thanks for listening to me ramble on for a full hour and, and a little bit um monday hopefully gabby will be back and we will be rescheduling our um podcast guest uh matt legere from legere home buyers hopefully he starts feeling better here pretty soon too sounds like he's not doing too good so Wishing that uh, Matt and Gabby feel better. And I hope also, I wish that you guys have a great weekend. You take some action today and this weekend and um, get you closer. Get closer to your goals. Okay. 
Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for listening. Want to be coached personally by Wayne and Gabby? Then you should join the Real Estate Investing Master's Mentorship Program. Details are in the show notes to get started.